handing it over to very new, awesome graduate students. There's Smriti over there. She will be one of your new presidents. And we have a speaker tonight, Devin Grobert, also from UT Austin. So this is Science Under the Stars, if you've never been. We host um, monthly during the semester um, talks by different uh, PhD students at UT Austin in our integrative biology. So they can come from ecology, evolution, and behavior, or plant biology. So we host a wide variety of different types of talks. And so let's get Devin's slides set up. And I will give this over to you to maybe introduce yourself a little bit and what you do. Thank you guys so much for coming out tonight. My name's Devin Grobert. Uh, thank you to Emily and Smurti for organizing and everybody tabling, super cool stuff to look at. Uh, I am a uh, PhD candidate in plant biology uh, in the Farrier, Caroline Farrier's lab, co-advised by uh, Norma Fowler. I'm also a senior biologist for the Water Quality Protection Land, which is part of Austin Water. Uh, and so today I'm going to talk to you guys about how and why Austin Water uses fire to restore ecosystems and how you can help. And there's tons of volunteer opportunities. There's a, a sign-up sheet up here at the front if you want our newsletter. And uh, yeah, hopefully there'll be time for questions at the end. So uh, in, in, uh, first I'll tell you guys a little bit of background about the water quality protection land. Then we'll talk about what kind of an ecosystem it is, and therefore how it could be managed. Uh, we'll talk about the relationships between plant communities and water cycling, uh, and some of the research I'm doing at UT with colleagues at UT and others at Austin Water about adaptive management, this process of updating our understanding of the system as we go, uh, and, uh, and then volunteer opportunities and hopefully a few questions. So uh, first of all, for the background of the WQPL, the Water Quality Protection Lands, I'm just going to hang out on this map slide for a minute. So for reference, there's the main campus of UT Austin, that little longhorn symbol. And here we are at BFL, Brackenridge Field Laboratory, of course. Who can guess, what is that yellow star? What do you think? Very good, Barton Springs Pool, beloved natural spring-fed water feature. Uh, and then down here we've got LBJ WFC, that's the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center. So I'm just giving you guys some uh, reference about how to look at this map and where we are. So up here it's kind of central Austin, UT and Barton Springs and stuff. Way down here, that's the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center, and that's kind of like the southwest edge of town, sort of, right? So uh, these blue outlined sections of the map are actually kind of hydrogeologic boundaries. The, uh, the, blue, the light blue area is the contributing zone <coughs> to the dark blue area. That's the recharge zone for the Edwards Aquifer, specifically the Barton Springs segment of the Edwards Aquifer. So here, this dark blue, that's the recharge zone all the rainwater that lands here or uh, creek water that flows across it has the opportunity to recharge the aquifer and that's what discharges at Barton Springs and supplies water to the wells of about 65,000 households. So what does this have to do with the WQPL, the water quality protection lands? Well, back in the 80s and 90s, there were periods where negative impacts to water quality from development pressure in the watershed we're causing the need to close the pool, sometimes for days, sometimes for months. And so there was this movement of grassroots activism, uh, citizens saying, we want our city to protect this treasured natural feature. And we need more restrictive development rules in the watershed. So, uh, you know, city leaders were responsive to that. And the trend would continue. Again, Barton Springs Pool would have to close. Water quality continued to decline. Uh, and so, meanwhile, there's rapid development happening in the Austin area, even back then. And some of these developers have 
land that they want to develop, and they buy land thinking, okay, I'm going to put 500 houses on this. Then there's a rule change because people are upset about water quality, and then they're told they can only put, what, 500 maybe. Wait, what did I start with? Anyway, just imagine I said a number that was half the original one the second time. So developers are upset. They lobby to state legislators. They say, these city guys are messing up our development deals. It's messing with housing prices and everything else. And we all need affordable housing. This is a, a point of tension between environment and development that affects everyone. And so uh, this goes on for a while. It, you know, the city is making uh, changes to our watershed ordinances to protect water quality. The state is undermining it. Uh, you know, citizens are upset. Developers are upset. There's a do documentary about it called The Unforeseen. It's really good. Ultimately, in 1998, they come up with this novel funding mechanism to protect the watershed. And the idea is they put it out to voters in a proposition, municipal uh, water utility revenue supported bond proposition saying we want to use this money to buy land and protect the Barton Springs segment in the edge of Zuckerberg. This has gone in front of voters a number of times, most recently in 2018, all with resounding approval. Voters like this. And so the money is used to uh, purchase what you see here in purple and black outline. And this was in uh, 1998, as I mentioned. Who knows, who was mayor at that time? Kirk Watson. That's right, today's mayor. <laughs> Kirk Watson was also mayor in 1998 in Austin. There's a documentary about this uh, where he's on film saying he came up with this. Pretty interesting that he had that idea because the same time, the same year, city planners in San Antonio had that same idea. And same with New York City. Many people have heard about their system where they bought a bunch of land in the Catskills to protect water quality. So right around the same time, all these different parts of the U.S., people were separately, at least according if you, you know, parse through these old documents like I sometimes do, people take credit for this independently. So it's just a moment, apparently, where this was the right move for municipalities that were having water quality issues. Uh, so the stuff outlined in black is the fee simple land. That means the city owns it outright, responsible for the management of these lands. That's where I work. Uh, the, the stuff in purple is conservation easements. So that means the city buys the development rights. So the landowner can stay there and they can live there, but they can't sell it and put a bazillion houses on it or anything like that. So the, the city buys the development rights permanently extinguishes them. So we have this 34,000 acre uh, system of protected land. That's bigger than all of the state parks in Central Texas put together. Uh, and, uh, and it's set aside for water quality protection. A couple of other notes on this map. Uh, the yellow lines are permanent vegetation transect monitoring sites. We'll talk about that more uh, a little later. And the red line is a groundwater flow path. So the largest, the single largest contributor to the volume of water that enters the uh, Edwards Aquifer, the Barton Springs segment in the Edwards Aquifer, is the Onion Creek watershed, which crosses the recharge zone down here. And so some researchers, employ people working with the city of Austin, working with folks at UT, including Jack Sharp, Nico Howard, they basically pour dye, it's food coloring. It sounds fun, but don't try it, it won't work. These guys know what they're doing. Uh, and so they pour food coloring in a cave, and they find it came out at Barton Springs 18 miles away in under three days. So uh, how much filtration do you think happens to water that's moving that fast in an aquifer? You think it gets like filtered well, it comes in dirty and comes out clean? Not really. Uh, so it's basically stone pipes. The water flows through fast. There's minimal filtration. So this whole area is a sensitive water quality area out west of Austin. I just like this map slide. We're going to talk about it a little more, and then we'll move a lot faster, I promise. Uh, so uh, up here you see, like, this is the Barton Creek Wilderness Area. A lot of it is joint managed by Austin Water and uh, Austin Parks. And you see how it's kind of dark green. That's closed canopy juniper woodland. A lot of that is occupied by the endangered golden cheek warbler. The only place it lives in the world is in central Texas. 
but and only next year that is. Uh, and you can see other areas this map have like a lighter color, like here on our Onion Creek management unit, and that's open grassland. That's what makes the difference. So this area we can see, you know, this is obviously one region. It all has the same climate. The map here is a geology map. That's the Edwards outcrop, Edwards limestone. So this whole thing has the same soil. So we have closed canopy woodland adjacent to open grassland. Closed canopy woodland down there on onion adjacent to open grassland. Here on the, this is the shield ranch. You can see kind of a semi-natural arrangement of woody and herbaceous plants. Uh, and so uh, we'll revisit that concept in a minute. So here's a, a cross section of the Edwards Aquifer. And this is just referring to that idea I mentioned of a contributing zone where we have surface watersheds of creeks, the recharge zone where there's this geologic outcrop where the, those creeks can contribute water into the aquifer. At that contact, you can have springs where it enters the artesian zone. And then, of course, it uh, supplies wells as well. So. Uh, what do you think would happen if you put a bunch of houses on the recharge zone? How would that impact groundwater recharge? Or maybe highways or parking lots? Does anybody have an idea? Like they're doing down at the Y? Yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah, it happens. So if you have a cave or a bunch of caves and you put in impermeable cover over it, water can't flow in and recharge the aquifer. So that's one thing that happens. Another thing is if you have natural vegetation cover and soils, water moves slowly and filters through. If you just have rooftops and roads and stuff, it moves really fast. It picks up pollutants. It can cause flooding. So those are the reasons it's a really sensitive area for water quality purposes. Uh, so we saw on the map, we have the same climate, same soils, but we have some areas that have closed canopy woodlands and others that have open grassland. And we're not the only place in the world that has that phenomena. So it turns out, you know, uh, 15, 20 years ago, uh, people had been deciding, well, we really need more trees on the earth. We really, we have this problem of greenhouse gas emissions, in, in particular carbon dioxide emissions from the excess burning of fossil fuels. And that's causing uh, all kinds of havoc in the climate and the world. We need to plant a lot more trees and offset that problem. And so planners or environmental planners look at maps and say, OK, the global tropics and subtropics, we have humid climates that can support closed canopy woodlands, but we have all these grasslands. So because the climate could, could have supported woodlands, those, those grasslands must be the product of de degradation, deforestation. That's where we've got to go plant trees. And uh, this leading savannah ecologist says, wait a minute, William Bond, and this is from 2005 in the journal Science, Highly biodiverse tropical grasslands are at risk from tree planting efforts. He points out some of these places might look like deforested and degraded sites from an aerial image or from a satellite image, but on the ground, there can be a uh, rich endemic ancient biota adapted to frequent fires. And so, you know, the idea is like these two images on the left are from Africa, and uh, you can have the same soils, the same climate. But whether or not the, the vegetation structure is wooded or grass dominated is a product of actually of plant traits. Some plants generate flammable foliage near the surface and promote the spread of fire. And that's got, they get a competitive advantage from fire sensitive species. Other plants uh, suppress the spread of surface fire. So if they have foliage that retains moisture after it dies, it rots really quickly versus if it has foliage that brings moisture back into the plant and stays dry. That promotes fire. Those are a couple of examples of fire adapted traits that show fire has been a part of natural ecological processes for evolutionary time scales. Uh, so there are a few ways. When we look at uh, a landscape in the Austin area, it can be hard to tell. Uh, it can be hard to interpret the natural history of a site because there has been a long history of degradation. One obvious form, we had a century or a century and a half of extensive, severe overgrazing. People put cows on a piece of land, and then they fenced them in so they can keep track of their animals. And then, uh, you know, the 
cows eat the grass and they put on weight and then the rancher sells some some meat and makes money and then it rains and the grass goes back and everything's fine it works just fine it's sort of mimicking like bison who would come through and graze these areas over long periods of time uh, and then there's a drought and then the cows eat the grass and it can't really grow back and then like meat everybody's trying to get rid of their cows all at once the price of meat goes way down so you kind of want to hold on to a few because you want that price to recover you want to restock your herd after two and then it keeps not raining and keeps not raining and keeps not raining and so then the grass just dies and so that gives when when it resumes you get soil erosion uh, you get woody plant encroachment because you favored grass uh, you favored woody plants uh, competitively against grass which are being suppressed by grazing and then you've also suppressed fire spread when you have uh, cattle grazing the excess foliage. On the other hand, you have wooded sites, and that timber is really valuable. You could build a cabin out of it. You could build. You can use uh, wood for fence posts. You can use it for railroad ties. That was a major industry for this part of the world. And so a couple of different sources of degradation have left little traits sometimes on the landscape of what's an appropriate vegetation cover. You might have just exotic grass, or you might have a monoculture of junipers, and who knows what was there before. So there are a few ways to understand the natural history of the site, a few different data streams. One of them is historical accounts. Uh, and you can look at these on, online. They're available to anyone. An example is John Bartlett is traveling from San Antonio to Fredericksburg on horseback, and he describes vast open grasslands with little clusters of live oak here and there. Famous landscape architect was uh, Olmsted in central Texas around the same time. These are all from about, within about 10 years of each other, sporting the Blanco and notes on the hills. Are, the hills are well wooded with cedar and live oak. And then Ferdinand Lindheimer, famous botanist of the mid 1800s, uh, commenting on ravines densely, you know, densely covered with cedars and underbrush. So we have kind of, these are all really close to each other, all these observations. They're within 10 years of each other, and some are describing grasslands and others woodlands. So what do we do with this? Well, there are other data streams available. Paleoecological data is an example, where we have uh, fossilized plant parts deposited in caves, carbon isotopes in soil, carbon isotopes in riparian sediments, basically, Woody plants sequester carbon and leave a different isotope signature in the soil compared to grasses. So you can look at these different data streams and they all kind of show fluctuating relative abundance of woody species versus grass species over the past 10 or 20,000 years from different sites around the Eastern Edwards Plateau. So all these things are kind of pointing to both grasses and woody plants are native. Here's a uh, photos from a prescribed burn. We do a burn and then the bear grass, if anybody's familiar with this, uh, Nolinda lindheimeri, it blooms like a hundredfold more than it would under any nor normal circumstance a couple of days after burning. So that seems to be like a fire adapted trait. It, uh, it has evolved with fire and it triggers this incredible flowering event. Uh, and we have another, you know, endemic endangered native species is the golden cheek warbler that relies on closed canopy woodlands. So all of these things are pointing to a disturbance dependent savanna that occurs in a shifting mosaic uh, over time of woody and grass dominance. So that's the kind of system we're dealing with, but what are the consequences for hydrologic cycling? What does it matter for water? Where are you, water utility? And that's why these lands were set aside and protected. Well, water yield is higher in grasslands than in woodlands. So there's a, th this is a kind of a study where each of these points is data from a separate study. They've compiled data from all over the world. The regression line associated with forests shows higher evapotranspiration. That's basically water lost to the atmosphere from the ecosystem uh, in forests compared to in grasslands. And that's a really rich subject. I have another talk that's on YouTube if you want to learn more about that. The WQPL speaker series you can find. Uh, so this is kind of what it looks like on the ground. Uh, so we have a site where, you know, there's woodlands in the background there up on the hill. There's a lot of small junipers that we've cut. And we pretty much obviously destroyed the place and we should be fired. And this is a horrible outcome. We left a couple of live oaks. 
and we and we just cut uh, the small junipers. But there's what it looks like a few years later. You know, there's a few uh, juniper branches on the ground, and the native grasses come back just fine. Here's another sequence similar. This is uh, a couple days before prescribed burn. This is that cured grass, super dry foliage. The plant takes the water out of the foliage when it dies and holds it in the roots and leaves this foliage that would, sh would shade out new growth. So it's kind of a liability. It's causing a, sh a self-shading problem, but it's advantageous for grasses to do this because they are fire prone. It gives them a competitive advantage against fire sensitive species. So, uh, you know, we've got a, a big live oak there and some underbrush. There's a wood line back here where there's woods and then a little cluster of brush coming out into the grassland. And there it is on burn day. We just destroyed the place. It's horrible. We should never do this again. Uh, oh, never mind. A few <laughs> days later, you know, you could see the live, I mean, that's actually a few weeks later. The live oak got fire pruned up, the underbrush uh, got scorched, and, you know, all of that grass thatch, the dead, uh, grass foliage has been cleared out of the way so you get a lot more wildflowers after a burn and then the, tr the fire doesn't carry through the woods it just kind of uh, scorches the trees on the edge of the wood line uh, here's another similar photo series of, I'm pointing to that live oak on the top of the hill for reference and then we've got a hill with a bunch of a hill slope with a bunch of small juniper on it and then a few years later that's what we're trying to do that's the the sequence of grassland restoration that we're trying to do. So we did a cutting project and then a prescribed fire, and this is the result. Uh, another thing we do a bunch of is cave work. Here's a cave, uh, Hoskins Hole. This thing is about 90 feet deep. Uh, it's eight foot diameter. This is on the Onion Creek management unit that those photos were from. And so ranchers uh, had used these kind of caves on the landscape just for, for trash, really, just trash pits. It was like, Back then, you didn't have trash service, and you also didn't want your animals falling into these huge pits. People weren't aware of that they have endangered species. This cave has five or six species of narrow, very narrowly endemic endangered species, beetles and spiders, things like that. Um, and volunteers, over the course of several months, came out bucket by bucket, pulled all the trash out of it. Uh, here's another case of uh, exploring caves to improve recharge and restore uh, hydrologic function. We're walking here in the bed of Onion Creek. This is a familiar scene for most of the time. Most of the year when you go to Barton Creek Greenbelt, it's just, the creek bed is just dry limestone. Uh, and so it's not unusual to see little fissures in the limestone. What's unusual here is that that one's blowing air. So if you find a crack in a limestone uh, bedrock substrate that's pushing air out, that shows you there's something big enough, there's a void space big enough under there to generate air currents. So that's like the most exciting thing that can happen when you're looking for caves. Uh, so, you know, the, the surfaces of these rocks gets kind of crusted with minerals, but you can kind of see there's a fissure there in the limestone and one under there under his very lovely lunchbox. And a few hours later, here's the view. So that rock outlined here just falls into the cave uh, from being chipped away at, and there's this big open cave under it, and the next time it rains, it looks like that. So this is a very efficient way to get water into the aquifer, is, is uh, cave excavation. That's an important part of our work. Uh, here's another similar series. So I'm pointing this rock that you'll see in the next few images. So this is about a meter deep. This is a cave in the bed of Onion Creek. The sediment in there is kind of mixed with leaves. I was on this uh, ECOR crew, this is 2007. I came to Austin to do uh, a job with the Texas Conservation Corps, like an AmeriCorps sort of thing. Uh, and there's my crew, we're digging in this cave and there's that same rock. So we've dug another meter or two. And there it is by 2013, so six years later. And there's the final product we've dug, you know, 35 feet of sediment out of here. And when you're going through there, you know it's recent sediment because it's mixed with leaves and there's the occasional beer can and it's loose material that's been washed into these caves uh, in flood events. Uh, so I mentioned earlier, we've got these uh, permanent vegetation transect monitoring sites and that's the kind of basis for my dissertation research at UT. 
So vegetation transect, we basically, it's an 800 foot line. It's always in the same place. There's 41 of them spread out representing about 12,000 acres of savanna landscape that we're trying to restore. Uh, and we record a bunch of different details about the plants that occur along this line, the species, the size, and where they are. And here's what we get, you know, this is uh, 15 years or so. I guess this data was from 2006 at the beginning to 2021. And, uh, you know, the average woody cover at the beginning, each of these lines is a different transect site, and the y-axis here is total woody plant cover out of 800. So the average uh, value here is about 40% woody plant cover. We do, you know, 100 or more prescribed burns, a, a little bit less than that thinning projects, but we do a lot of work over the next 15, 20 years. And at the end, it's 40%. So again, we just totally failed, right? It didn't do anything. We did all these burns and all these cutting projects. It got nothing for it. Well, actually, what we think would have happened is it would have gone from 40% to about 85% woody plant cover. So we really, we had a maintenance regime to maintain savanna structure on the landscape. And so, uh, you know, this is more of my results from my dissertation research. So um, basically we've learned, we expect woody plant encroachment to occur at about two percent per year if we do a growing season fire that's these red points on this plot uh, we expect woody plant cover to go down by a mean of about nine percent uh, per treatment so what do you guys think if you wanted to do a maintenance regime and woody plant encroachment goes increases by two percent a year and your one tool in your tool toolkit is a growing season fire how often do you have to repeat that if you just want to maintain current cover? Four or five years, exactly right. Very similar with juniper thinning. You might be thinking, well, can't you just cut down all the trees? Why, do, why, do they, why does it only make that modest of a difference? And it's because we're only cutting the small ones. We're not going after the big ones. We want to uh, reverse recent woody plant encroachment into grasslands, not replace woodlands with grass. Uh, and then winter fire, that's fire and mostly in January and February, less than 1% reduction in woody cover per treatment. So you have to do that very frequently if you want to have that as a maintenance regime. So in this way, we've kind of refined our understanding of the system works and how the system works and what's an appropriate maintenance regime. Uh, and if you want to do a restorative regime and reduce woody plant cover, you've got to do growing season fire or thinning less than every four years. If you do it every three years or so, you should incrementally and gradually see a reduction in woody plant cover. What we're doing now is pretty much around four to five years average mean long-term treatment regime. Uh, so here's the fun part where you guys can get involved. Uh, we also do a kind of a community supported seed-based restoration project at the watershed scale. And this, is, this forms the basis of how, how we approach this work, these two documents. So Mary Sophie Young was a very fine botanist, worked at UT in the early 1900s. She documented, made an, a very detailed annotated checklist of the flora of the Austin area between about 1900 and 1920. And then we have another of these, Bill Carr, one of the preeminent field botanists in the state of Texas did it 100 years later. And so this forms, this is our target, is to try to restore the biodiversity that was here 100 years ago and make it sort of a living biological reservoir. And uh, here's an example. This is wild hyacinth. This species was common at the time of Mary Sophie Young. And we had exactly zero of these plants on the 12,000 acres of the WPPL when we started. Um, and so one of the aspects of this work is you've got to go out and one of the things you guys can get involved with if you're interested in volunteering, you've got to go out and find the remnant stands, the places you want to harvest seed from. You've got to find them when they're easy to see, when the blooms are colorful like this. Then uh, we've got a ripeness monitoring uh, project in iNaturalist. I started this in notebooks in 2013. Now we have almost 2,000 observations, 265 species, 17 people contributing. And the idea is you, you just, uh, you get used to the high quality sites, what plants are there, and you try to track the ripeness status of the seed over time. And so in this 
uh, project, you know, you open this up, you can search for an iNaturalist ripeness monitoring, and it'll give you these fields. You just populate the ripeness condition. We'll train you about how to determine that, uh, the size of the stand, where you saw it, and whether or not you harvested it. And we're very careful about uh, not over harvesting, not damaging the resource. Uh, so if it says yes, harvested, we know to not to harvest from that site in the future. If it's a rare species, we might harvest 10% in 10% uh, of years. If it's something abundant and perennial, maybe we go up to 50% and harvest about every other year. And here, uh, this book, uh, the Tall Grass Restoration Handbook, co-authored by David Mahler, was my mentor in this work. Uh, he's one of the people that founded the discipline of restoration ecology about 50 years ago. And they give you this, uh, you know, here's what you're looking for. If you want to track ripeness in seeds, the, the seeds are full size, the coats are changing color, the stems are dry and no longer nourished by the roots and leaves. So like the stem that has the seed on it, if it's dried up, then you know it's probably okay to harvest the seed in the earliest seed uh, form seed is dropping. So those are kind of the things you're looking for. Uh, and here's some of the stuff you will find. Cowboy looking dudes with cool grass. Uh, so this is a site where we harvested a small amount of Melica from the uh, floodplain of Onion Creek. A few miles away, we did a prescribed fur a burn and deposited a small amount of seed. Two or three years later, there were a few Melica plants. A decade later, the, the site is totally transformed. Underneath the uh, live oak trees, there's a continuous layer of melica that, that carries low intensity surface fires that we can manage and maintain grassland with. Uh, this is an example, uh, the bottom left is an example of an old growth grassland. So some researchers at A&M A have used sites on the WQPL as reference sites to compare, to measure the efficacy of restoration efforts. And they're pretty small, they're pretty few and they're far between, but it's like a totally intact highly biodiverse grassland ecosystem on a, you know, a few acre plot where for some reason it didn't get woody encroached. It never got overgrazed by some miracle, you know? And then another site, and, and this is the, uh, you know, tons of that liatris seed at, at peak ripeness. And that's what you're looking for. Another one is where we have like, this is kind of a weedy species, silver blue stem, but it's a very competitive uh, plant. It's a close relative of the invasive grass, King Ranch blue stem. So it's really valuable for our restoration project, even if it isn't specifically for, you know, plant conservation. It's good for other ecosystem functions. And this is kind of just the vibe when you do the seed harvesting. You got a little paper grocery bag and some nice, friendly, interesting people to hang around with. And it's just sort of slow, meditative work and real fun. And you can come do it with us. Uh, if you want to do indoor stuff or if the weather's bad and we, we just need to be inside for a given event, another thing we do is seed cleaning. This is kind of a typical harvest, 60 to 100 pounds of wild harvested seed. Uh, we also do some nursery work. There's a hoop house here, lovely views, friendly people. You should come check it out on Friday mornings if you ever get a chance. But uh, why would we do nursery work, right? Because we're managing 12,000 acres and it's to supply uh, seed production plots. So some of these species, we don't work with species that are uh, like listed, like really threatened or endangered, anything that's really on the brink of survival because it's so sensitive to ge genetic ma manipulation from us doing horticulture stuff with it. So we work with stuff that's underrepresented, stuff that's like way less common on the landscape than it used to be, but not like on the brink of death. And we're careful about having multiple uh, source genotypes so as to not do in, uh, you know, cause those kinds of problems. And so here's an example. This is, uh, was known as uh, Silphium asperimum by, in the time of Mary Sophie Young. Now we call it Silphium radula. And uh, you know, I, now, because we are growing it like row crops, because volunteers are out here weeding and taking care of it the rest of the year, we're able to put it on the landscape at a pretty good scale. And that's not something you could buy. And there's only something like when you find this in the wild, it's a special thing. Silphium's a really strong indicator. Very much, very uh, noxious weed that suppresses biodiversity. And it's sensitive to growing season fire. So they burned it in last June, June 29th and had like 80% mortality. These bright green ones 
that's uh, Little Blue Stem, the native grass, just pops right back after a growing season fire. And we're about to just hand spread the seed and uh, rake it in. Uh, and I have a couple of other cool plant photos if you want to see, or we can take questions at this point. And so here's my email and phone number if you're interested and have questions, or check out this URL, and that's where you sign up for events. Uh, should we do questions? Does anybody have questions? Let's see if this thing works. People hear me well? Yeah. I hope so. This is our other microphone that we've been trying to get to work for a while so that we can do questions and hear each other. So, if somebody has a question in a quiet voice, I have a microphone for you. Okay, so now is me trying to see your hands in the dark. Well, what percentage of the land around Austin has, has you all worked on? Like half of the land? Great question. I'm going to go back to that favorite slide in here. Uh, so from memory, I think we're protecting about uh, one quarter of the recharge zone and about 10% of the contributing zone. Maybe it's a little higher now. We recently acquired this piece. That's the uh, Nature Conservancy Barton Creek Habitat Preserve. So maybe 10 or 12% of the contributing zone and 25% of the recharge zone. But this is all just southwest of Austin, you know? So I don't know, in terms of the Austin area, I don't know as a percentage. About 34,000 acres total. So as you're doing this, um, and you've been doing it over the years, and the temperatures have been going up and it's getting drier, how is climate change and the drought affecting your restoration efforts? Uh, it's a great question. Um, I think that um, drought mortality affects, uh, it affects woody plant cover somewhat negatively. I mean, uh, but it's pretty negligible in the grand scheme of things. That background rate of 2% encroachment per year, that includes 2011 drought and the scorchers we've had the past couple of summers too. Uh, I think the biggest challenge uh, is probably in getting the herbaceous diversity back on the landscape, but I put up this slide because it's really nothing new, you know? I, I mean, we have wet springs and you put out a bunch of seed and then you just feel like, uh, we're, we're doing amazing, everything works perfect. And then like, and then you have normal years and uh, your seed, maybe some of it germinates and then it gets incredibly hot. And this system, that's just how it works. I think the, the northern uh, parts of the tall grass savanna so the eastern edge of the, the Great Plains in North America are tall grass savanna. A lot of those places are reliably wet in the spring long enough to get plants established that they can go dormant during drought. Here, it can just be so rapid. You don't have a long enough establishment period, but I don't think that's new. You know, I, I went back to this slide because, you know, for example, from Hall's Cave, this is, I think they get about uh, eighty percent of the precip that we get here per year, otherwise very similar. So maybe a decent proxy for climate change in the next few decades. Um, it's just a crashy kind of system in a way. You know, we've had in the in the southwest of the U.S. Uh, there was the alpha thermal drought some four or five thousand years ago, and it went to ninety-five percent grass dominance. This is from a site on Fort Hood. And then it just recovered, you know, over the course of a few more millennia. So I think that the system is adapted to climate extremes already. And it's hard to imagine going back, you know, it looks like in the next century, we might have higher temps than in the past 3 million years. And to see how dramatic the changes in the land cover have been over the past 20,000 years, uh, it's pretty hard to imagine what that's going to look like. But so far, we can just see these plants are really adapted to extremes.
we ask to be with her and to help prevent scratch-ins. Is there any concern with the conservation of the golden geese warbler? Yeah, that's a great question, something we take very seriously. So uh, we, we basically just spend a lot of effort surveying and give a wide buffer to areas that can support warblers. So on the, on the WQPL fee simple part where we're managing land, it's 12,000 acres and actually 7,000 of that are in burn units, active savanna restoration projects. So the other five are just set aside as woodland and that's in perpetuity, they're always going to be woodlands and they're going to be managed to support uh, warbler habitat. So great question. It's an urgent conservation problem. So um, what's the most common woody species you see taking over these remnant savannas? So yeah, ash juniper is, the, is by far the most uh, uh, ex responsible for wood encroachment into grasslands. It seems like it probably needs to be established. Uh, juniper needs to be established before other woody plants can uh, uh, establish in the community. Um, in the woodland sections, what are you doing to prevent catastrophic wildfire, like a Yellowstone situation? We don't really, we're not really doing active management management in, on the, in the woodlands on the WQPL. There are some sites where we do juniper thinning projects and so we're cutting the smaller trees and what's left would look to a lot of people like a woodland, but the distinguishing factor for us is surface grass, continuous surface grass. Uh, and on the WQPL, you know, the areas that are, are wooded have golden cheek warbler and so they're protected. So the ability to manage or to intervene in, in the community is very limited. Those are protected woodlands, it means you can't go in and cut. There are some sites that uh, Austin Parks and Rec manages. They're being, being really proactive about that, especially near neighborhoods and roads and other developments where if you do a thinning project in these woods, there's more water left for the remaining trees, right? So they're less susceptible to drought. Also, the canopy bulk density is reduced if you pull out a bunch of trees. And so then the resulting wildfire intensity should be reduced. Uh, I think that there's a ceiling on that, though. If you have a really hot fire and you've pulled out 10%, 20%, 30% of the trees, it's still going to be devastating. Uh, if it's a moderate, fire, then that can make all the difference. And uh, I think those efforts are really useful, but where we have the opportunity to intervene in that way, we go for savanna restoration. Uh, and where where we have warblers, it's protected and we don't intervene. It's something that we've considered, trying to at, apply for a permit, a research permit with Fish and Wildlife to see, can we do thinning in these to re improve resilience? But it's not something that we, we've acted on yet. It's a great question. One thing I'd like to uh, talk about is, and I'd like to get your help on, is you go to Orincopy Bend, you go to Flat Lane. There are great fields of grass, so they're all the same kind of grass. They're birds that migrate north from Venezuela, they want to breed there. But people from the city mow that grass down right away and put it into great bundles so they can sell those bundles for a little bit of money. Uh, I would like for you all to get involved in trying to convince the city to make that grassland a much more interesting grassland and not be constantly mowing it down as soon as it comes up. And then you just have a flat area with no grass at all, just bare ground, and not a place where birds or animals can live. So it's on Flat Lane, and it's right around the headquarters of Worthy Bend, and that's one thing I want to try to work on is leave that grass, make it. And what impresses me what you're doing is the diversity you're getting. And with there, you just have this one kind of grass. I don't know what it is. Yeah, I think that site uh, it was designed by environmental engineers. And I've, I've raised that possibility to them. Why don't we do grassland restoration out here? And um, the response was kind of like, well, this has value to the surrounding landowners to, to make this hay and provide it. And so you know, they've won awards and they're kind of saying, we just have a different approach and we've gotten awards for it and we're recognized for it. And so stay out of our hair. So that's kind of the response I got as a fellow city employee sticking my nose in places. 
Uh, but, you know, I think that the, the city is values input from its constituents. And I think if you want to get involved out there, there's a, a really uh, impressive uh, bird watching and just field naturalists uh, and, and nature education kind of community at that site. And so, uh, you know, your kind of observations would probably be valued the most. I was wondering if, like, fire is a helpful management tactic in any other ecosystems, or if it's, like, mainly grasslands that people have found it most helpful in. Really interesting question. My advisor, Norma Fowler, is, is got a, uh, submitted a paper right now that she's trying to say that there is a lost ecosystem in central Texas that is a, a woodland that's adapted to low-intensity surface fires, and they've just they just don't exist here anymore. And there are a couple of species, including the endangered Streptanthus, bracted twist flower, that seems to really need to grow in the woods and really benefit from fire. Uh, so uh, throughout the state, you know, there are many kinds of, and actually in the world, there are many kinds of uh, uh, ecosystems that, that rely on fire. Another example of a savanna that can sometimes look like a woodland is the longleaf pine savanna. And that's famously all many of the plants there are like really specific fire adaptations. So yeah, not just grass. Great. I think we oh, there we go. There's one more question. So can I go back to something you said early on about the Edwards Aquifer and ask that? I know it's not about the fire, but I I've been in Austin since 74. So everything you talked about, I've gotten to watch firsthand. And what, when you were talking about what do you think would happen if you built a highway or did something in the recharge zone? And, you know, Oak Hill, when I moved here, it was a tiny road to Oak Hill. And then we had all the signs, environmentally sensitive area, and we didn't develop the highways there because of the recharge zone. And now, there's a massive project going on, which when you drive by, and I'm a geologist, I know what hydrology and stuff is, it's not protecting the recharge zone. And my question is this, is that because the state is bulldozing the city over this recharge zone we've been trying to protect? Or why is the why in Oak Hill <laughs> being put there? Because this, you, everything you were describing was trying to protect the recharge and you know, clean out caves, and one of the best identified areas is now being totally destroyed. And we'll have all those things you asked, what do you think about putting this there? <laughs> so do you know why it's being allowed? This is my question. Uh, I don't have any specific insight into that, that project. Uh, Sorry, I know it was off course, but I just thought you... Having yeah. worked at the city, you might know, is that the state shoved it down the city's throat or something? Uh, yeah, I wish I had insight on that. I'm kind of focused on the restoration ecology stuff, and I Thank often you. talk to the public, and they they want, I, I've had this before, where I don't really have the urban watershed and the politics. I'm not as up on that. Uh, sorry, I can't speak to it. How do we get it ready to put on the, how do we get seed ready to put on the ground? Uh, so, you know, I think well more than half of the seed is commercially sourced. There are some great uh, suppliers throughout the state. We do the normal uh, low bid purchasing thing government agencies have to do, and we're allowed to specify we want, you know, stuff that is good for climate adaptation purposes, stuff that was grown or native to locally or a little west or a little south of us. Uh, so the bulk of it comes from that, but uh, the really the quality of it, our seed restoration work, seed-based restoration work, comes from the wild harvested sand. So volunteers collect these directly off the landscape. Those just perform way better over time. It takes a while to see. It's not that first generation that you put that makes the difference. It's several generations. But your question, uh, how do we get it ready? So there's like, are you getting it like uh, the the seed cleaning volunteer work. So we have to 
harvest it when it's ripe. We try not to get it when it's dry, like when, when the landscape is dry enough. And then uh, there's this cool shaker table. My colleague, Matt McCaw, now works with the Parks Department, brilliant restoration ecology guy, built this shaker table thing. It's like plywood, and then that's a reciprocating saw modified to vibrate this screen. So you dump wild harvested seed on there, and the good stuff shakes through, and you can scoop off the bad stuff. And then a lot of it is this really meticulous, slow hand work. Was that, is that what the question was about? Great. Okay, let's put our hands together for uh, Devin. Thank you so much. That's a great talk. Quick announcement before we disperse. Uh, for next month, for March, uh, the talk will be on the third Thursday, which I think is the 21st. Um, and we'll obviously be sending out emails about that, but just to let you know. Thank you so much for coming, and thank you, Devin. Thank you to all the talks.